Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 133 of Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and compare them to the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got quite a big assortment, we've got a couple frogs, we've got a couple invertebrates and we've got some birds so... Uh, very interesting assortment of animals, so we're going to get started right away. So, Leaf and Scott. Scott is uh, kind of renowned in the modern community for a lot of the smaller mods. Uh, have a look at here. So, in here we have got uh, one of his first mods. This is the Bar Barson, or Baron's Montella. So, this is a type of little frog. So, we'll have a look. So, let's have a look at these little guys. And there's a little cutie sitting on the on there. So, uh, the genus name is Mantella barony, which is common names includes the Baron's Mantella, the Vaginated, uh, Vigorated Golden Frog, or the Madagascar Poison Frog. They're a type of small uh, poisonous frog from Madagascar, which is really interesting. So uh, it was first named by George Albert Bologur in 1888, where they got the uh, who penned the binomi name after Richard Baron, who actually was a botanist who studied a lot of. Uh, Stuff and he was also a missionary and studied the species a lot in Madagascar. So this group, uh, Mantellidae, is a group of uh, frogs that are only found in Madagascar. And this family of frogs was estimated to have colonized or got to um, uh, Madagascar about 76 to 87 million years ago. And then evolved in that time. Uh, isolated from everything else that evolved into a endemic group, uh, especially around the islands. Uh, there's approximately about 220 species of frogs found in Madagascar, including 15 in Mantelli, uh, Mantella, only found in Madagascar, and the Baron's Mantella has like a moderate range uh, throughout eastern central Madagascar, inland from the coast, but north, uh, up, up into the north and south, which is pretty cool. So their natural habitat is like subtropical or tropical moist lowland forests, subtropical or tropical mountain forests, and degraded forests as well. They like those as well. And they typically prefer being between 600 to 1200 meters above sea level. And all the species is typically considered least concern uh, due to their wide population. We don't know their trends and it's thought that they may be threatened a lot by habitat loss. Also things like agriculture, industrialization, uh, timber and logging and things like that that could be uh, big issues for the species but it is considered least concern so it's not too desperate so in terms of this one the uh we'll have a look at the ventral view have a look at it look at the cute little guy so the at only 28 to 32 millimeters in length there's actually one of the largest uh of the 16 genus species and it's dropped only by some other mantellas so it's one of the larger ones and the other ones kind of get between range to 18 to 31. So this is pretty big for a Mantella frog. And they generally exhibit sexual dimorphism. I'm not sure if it's sewed in here. Uh, but they do have some sort of sexual dimorphism. So typically the females will be slightly larger than the uh, males. And the difference in size can be quite prominent in about 11 to 12 months. Uh, 10 to 12 months I mean. So it's quite cool. Little friends. Let's see if we can find another one. And, uh, let's look at you. No, oh, let's pick another one. I'd love to look at you since you're in a nice position. Um, in terms of most individuals, uh, you can see they have unique characteristics from other Mentelli species, like they have a rostral line, things like that, and tiger-like markings on the hind limb. That's how you can kind of tell them apart. But there's lots of uh, phenotypic, uh, obviously, variability, so it can be sometimes confused with other species as well, and lots of other different colorations. And there's a few very similar species uh, that can kind of be hard to tell apart from these guys. The only way you can tell apart, tell them apart is kind of like the tiger, the orange the orange legs with the tiger stripes, and also this sort of line at the top here that's one of the main ways you can kind of tell them apart. And typically much stronger, darker colors. These are the very similar species. In terms of reproduction and activity, they tend to be, uh, they have short clicks that they produce during the day to assert their dominance and attract females to mate with them. Uh, females can lay up to 130 unpigmented eggs in a single clutch, and they're almost always near some sort of water, uh, which the resulting tailpipes uh, get washed by rainfall, which is pretty interesting. And in terms of their diet and predation, we'll talk about this a little bit more with the golden mentally, their relative. Uh, they're a very active forager and consume a great number of prey, and, uh, and compared to like a large arthropods and a lot of the mentella species, they'll eat quite large uh, arthropods. 
And they typically hunt during the day and they feed on ants, uh, but they'll also feed on beetles, spiders, and mites. And ingesting mites actually allows them to uh, secrete uh, alkaloid from their skin. That's a toxin for predators, which is pretty interesting. And if you ingest them, it can cause sickness. Uh, and it can fluctuate depending on the location, stuff like that, depending on what they're eating. But careless human handling has always been discouraged. So if you're going around human activity, make sure you've, so you've got to be careful. Uh, remote populations may actually be more potent. Uh, but uh, ones near people may be a little bit more like safer because obviously because um, there's not as much food for them and it's not quite as toxic. But yeah, really, really cool animal. So that's the Baron's Mantelli done by Leaf and Scott. Next one is another member of the genus. We'll speed over here. Done by uh, Leaf and Scott as well. We've got the Golden Mantelli. No, Mantella. Well, let's look at that one right there. We can have a look at two. Look at this little one. So... Uh, while the uh, the Baron's Mentelli is considered least concerned, this one's sadly considered endangered. So as I mentioned, they're another small terrestrial frog native to Madagascar. And they're only really found in a few small places, which is and actually considered one of the most threatened amphibians in Madagascar due to its limited distribution, where their areas are kind of very much uh, encroached by people. And they may be overcollected for the pet trade. So in terms of their description and size, these guys they can be usually uh, pretty much uniform yellow, orange, or red color and get about 20 to 26 millimeters in long. So not very visually distinct, just mainly just a bright gold, pretty much. And in terms of their behavior, they're actually highly seasonal. And they typically remain inactive during the winter months from May to October. But during the summer, they're commonly active during the day. They live in groups of typically twice as many males as females. And when the rains arrive and the temperatures warm, the frogs will emerge from hiding and use uh, small uh, wetlands for breeding. Males will often co uh, call for concentrated positions near a water source. And it actually is like a click, very similar to the Baron's one. And they do not seem to engage in typically uh, and plexus as the brother the male and moves and stuff over the female at the back as well. And typically eggs are laid on moist leaf litter or near water. And when the rain arrives, the tadpoles are washed into the land, from the land into the water. In terms of these guys' diets as well, they have a diet of small invertebrates. In the wild, they eat mites, ants, flies, and collarbones. And these uh, frogs actually, as very much mentioned before, they are toxic. So they get their uh, toxins from the food that they eat. And uh, there are snakes that are adapted to eat them, though. And it only depends on their diet. So in captivity, people do catch them. And there's bound significant differences in uh, captive and wild mentalities. And they're kept in the pet trade and kept by like exotic animal collectors, but also the uh, zoological institutions because they're quite active during the day. They're quite beautiful and things like that. Another benefit, though, is that care sheets can be easily found, but they are critically endangered and most are caught in the wild. And it's critical and the population is decreasing. So don't get this one unless you're planning to breed them for captive red or you're a zoo. So try and don't get these guys. Very interesting as well, uh, as I'm going to talk about with this with both Mantelli, all Mantelli frog species, uh, Mantella frog species, they are poisonous. So this is very similar to, you know, your Central American poison dart frogs. Uh, that shows a lot of common evolution there. So that's two independent lineages. So these guys have never been really around each other. Uh, as I mentioned, the Mantellas genus is in Madagascar, and all of the poison dart frogs are in Central and South America. So they live very separate parts of the world. And, but they've evolved the same kind of poison that they get from their food to defend themselves. So that's a great example of convergent evolution. Our two independent lineages of frogs have developed the same defense strategy. And it seems to work pretty well for them. Uh, though these guys are in danger, that's because of humans. But other than that, they seem to be doing quite well. We'll have a look at the other golden mentalities. So this is again done by Scott. Scott always does a wonderful job with these guys. So we're going to move on. We've had enough of frogs, plenty of frogs. Now we're going to move on to some invertebrates. So how can you not love invertebrates? So let's have a look at the flat rock scorpion, also done by uh, Leaf and Scott. So uh, this is Hadogen's troglodytus. So these are a species of frog, uh, not frog, uh, scorpion from South America. They're commonly known as the flat rock scorpion. And they were once actually regarded as the largest species of scorpion, but then lost that title to the African uh, giant, or the emperor scorpion, I believe. Yeah, or the giant forest scorpion, who's just three centimeters longer. These guys are about 20 centimeters. The giant forest scorpion's about uh, 23 centimeters. And um, so they are basically up there with some of the biggest. 
And they're known from the Limpopo province and can be found in Botswana, Zimbabwe and Mozambique in the west parts. And you can see the overall body is consistent with other members of its genus. You know, it's got the big uh, talson there. It's got the big uh, carapace and all that, all that good stuff. And they tend to like living in rocky outcrops as well. And they're all flattened to allow them to move within those rocky outcrops. They're characterized by that highly specialized curd talson. And they've got pretty large claws as well that allow them to move quickly through the environment and through grass uh, and sands as well. And in terms of their habitat, they tend to thrive in a slightly humid rock environment. So they like to live in cracks and carapaces uh, and crevasses around the place. And they actually remain highly localized because they like these outcrops. And they're unable to travel for uh, extended periods of time in the sand because they can die. So that means they can be threatened a lot by habitat loss because usually they're quite isolated. So in their habitat, they could, be, oh, they could die, which is not good. Very, very cool guys though. In terms of uh, their behavior, they're very reclusive. And they're likely to remain unseen unless their hiding place has been disturbed. And the species of scorpion, like most scorpions, are typically sting as a last defense against a predator and will try to flee before they fight. Uh, they're nocturnal hunters, so they prefer to leave their uh, hunting spots or their hiding spots when they're cooler. And then will predate on insects up to its own body size, so they can eat pretty big insects and things. Uh, they're also quite adept at burrowing and can have, uh, excavate the soil pretty fast. And they'll often do it beneath a stone or something to make a new den. And a troglodytus will actually use its tail to assist in burrow as they sweep the dude away with their tail, which is another quite interesting thing they do. They're also highly territorial and will fight to the death with other scorpions uh, when kept in close quarters in captivity and have been known to eat each other. So if you don't, so this is not very realistic. You wouldn't want to have this many in an enclosure. Probably a, uh, try to keep as ter high territorial. So as you shred them apart, you need to make sure that they don't come in contact with each other. And they have a very mild venom, that pain only lasts several minutes. So unlike a lot of the other scorpions, they're not quite as potent uh, venom as a lot of other ones. But it works for their prey. And yeah, it's a pretty cool mod. I'm definitely a big fan of this little rock scorpion. Definitely a cool little guy. Let's have a look at another one. Little friend. Definitely a worthwhile little friend. So you can find... Is there any ones in there? Cool. Very cute. Alright, so that's all the... So... Both of the frogs and the flat rock scorpion, let me just see, were all done by Leaf and Scott. Very, very awesome. Scott probably does the model and Leaf does the coding. Uh, next up as well, we have got one done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. So we're going to have a look at another invertebrate. We have got here the Hercules Beetle. Uh, one really cool one I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Let's have a look at you there. So this is the Hercules beetle. This is a male, I believe. So the Hercules beetle is a species of rhinoceros beetle that is native to the rainforests of Mexico, Central America, South America, and Antilles. And is the longest extent or longest living species of beetle in the world. And is one of the largest flying insects in the world. So Dionytes Hercules comes from, obviously, Hercules, the Greek uh, demigod with the great strength. I think we all are familiar with that myth. If you've seen any Disney movies or played God of War, you're probably familiar with Hercules. <laughs> but yeah, really, really cool. They have a quite a complex taxonomic history, as I'm trying to figure out where they were. But there are several species described, subspecies described, that we don't know which is which. So in terms of size, these guys... Uh, not including their horn, it varies between 50 to 85 millimeters, or about 2 to 3 inches, and have a length of about 29 to 42 millimeters or in width, so about 1.1 to 1.7 inches. And males have been recorded to be up to 7 inches, or 170 millimeters long, that include their horn, which makes them the longest beetle in the world. And if jaws or horn are included in that measurement uh, as well, the size of the horn could be variable, depends on the overall body size, uh, legs and wings, things like that could be with that as well. And they're also highly sexual dimorphic. So this is a male model. So only the males will exhibit this big characteristic horn and the females looks look much more like a typical beetle. They don't have the big horn, very much more like a typical beetle. And typically you can see they've got that the olive green color, but if it's uh, higher humidity, they'll actually will darken to get a bit darker when there's high humidity, which is interesting. So there's quite a big population that can be found in southern Mexico, Bolivia, downland into forest, the Tobago, Peru, very wide uh, range. But in terms of their uh, life cycle, not much is actually known. But evidence has been gathered through captive breeding them. So the mating season is typically during the raining season 
from July to December. And females will have an average gestation period of about 30 days from copulation to laying her eggs. And she may live, uh, lay up to about 100 uh, eggs in uh, dead wood. And these eggs will incubate and actually hatch after about 27 days. And once they hatch, they actually may last up to two years in this larval stage. It's a really big grub, uh, which is huge. Um, and they're actually one of the considered largest grubs in the world. And then they'll go through three metamorphous stages called instars. And the larvae are like a yellow body with a big black head. And they can grow up to about 100 millimeter, uh, 11 centimeters, or about 4.5 inches. or weigh more than 100 grams. And this actually shows how huge they are, so it's really, really cool. And then once they go through their last instar after about two years, uh, the pupil stage can last about the third stage 30 days, and then they'll become an adult beetle. And adult beetles can live for about three to six months in captivity. So in terms of their diet, these guys are cephalophagus, which means they feed mainly on rotting wood, and they reside in the same wood uh, during the two-year development stage. They'll fe also feed on fruits and tree sap as well, and adults can actually carve through bark as well. With their mandibles being closed, they can actually suck out tree sap too, but they've been observed feeding on all sorts of fruits like mangoes, bananas, pears, and peaches in captivity. In terms of the behavior, within the native rainforest habitats, they are nocturnal and typically will forage for fruit and hide in burrows within the leaf litter for the day. And they're actually able to create a huffing sound by stridulating their abdomen that can warn predators. And they communicate through chemoreception, sight and mechanical perception, so they're able to use pheromones and things to communicate with other beetles. And part of the, why do they have this big horn? So the males have the big horn for the same reason deers have antlers. So they actually will engage in combat to fight for females. The males will kind of joust with each other. Uh, they'll push around each other and they're quite strong. And they'll try to pin and grab the rival and throw them down. And the male that wins these fights will obviously get the females. And they're quite strong. So there's been studies that suggest that these guys can carry up to 850 times their body weight. So... Uh, Actual measurements have been much smaller, so about 100 times their body weight at a point which they could barely move. So they'll be able to lift 100 times their body weight, which is pretty interesting. And their relationship with humans is, does not actually really kind of negatively affect human activities and can be kept as pets. So um, there have also been enzymes that they can use potentially in cleaning products that can be found in fecal matter of these guys, which is pretty interesting. And they're quite important for the environment. They are they're tritivores, so they break a lot of rotting and uh, digest a lot of that rotting stuff, which is really, really good for the environment. And they cycle nutrients through the ecosystem. But yeah, another really, really cool little beetle friend. Definitely a big fan of this guy. Really, really cute. So next up, let's, why is my thing not working? There we are. So next up, we've got a returning mod. So this one's done by Great Cake Mods. We've got the Paradise Shell Duck, so a really, really cool one. We'll just cover this one again. So this, this one's got a little bit of an update. So the Paradise Shell Duck, also known as the Paradise Duck, or Patanarangi in uh, Māori, is a species of shell duck, which is a group of kind of like gross like ducks that are only found in New Zealand. And they originally considered the same genus as like mallards and things like that, but then were put in their own genus of Antindora Vigendita, I believe you say that. So first described in 1789 by German naturalist Johann Frederick Gelm uh, in his revised edition of Systematica Nature by Carl Linnaeus. But then it was actually into their own genus. But you can see they're quite a colourful, large-bodied duck species. And both males and females have that chestnut colour to them as well. But uh, to, and with the white feathers as well, you can see going on there. They have black legs and they're webbed for swimming. And um, they're actually among the largest of their genus. They measure about 63 to 71 centimeters, or about 25 to 28 inches in length, and weigh between 1.9 to 2 kilograms uh, in weight, which averaging about 1.72 or 38.8 pounds for the males, and 1.29 to 2.8 for the females, with a wingspan about 90 centimeters. So you can see here the adult male. I got this wrong last time, but the adult male here, oh, that's not right. Adult males have a really, really cool blue black head that's iridescent. And a black rump to their tail as well. Probably not the best one to look at. We'll find there's the male here. And uh, Great Cake Mobs actually added iridescence to it, so it looks a little bit nicer. So yeah, this is the male. This is what the male looks like. And the wings of the male also has upper white coverts and kind of metallic green spectrum colors as well. And the male also has a dark gray and pale white abdomen, so you can see some of the difference between. And then you look at the female uh, over here. The female is almost entirely white head and a little bit lighter in color. The female's a little bit lighter, which is really, really interesting. And they typically, the rest of the body is very similar to the male, and they have a little bit of color, but mainly the head is the biggest difference. 
And uh, the the downy, the babies, you can see here, the cute little babies, they typically get their down colors. Uh, you can see they're kind of like a brown crown and brown stripes down their body. Look like a little mallard. Very, very cute. And juveniles males actually look much like the adults. Uh, and the females are smaller with a white uh, patch on the brill there. And then they typically will start to look like an adult between their first molt and one to two months after fledging. They'll turn to dark chestnut and get their adult colours. So the vocal colours that you get uh, differs from males and females. So the males will make like a honk like a goose when they're alarmed. But the females will give a zig zig, which is a pretty interesting sound. So in terms of the distribution and habitat, uh, Paradise Shell Ducks are uh, one of the most widely distributed uh, uh, fowl, waterfowl in New Zealand. They inhabit most of the North Island, including some islands like Little Barrier, Great Barrier, and uh, Kapiti Island. They also live on South Island, Stewart Island, places like that. And they're most common around the North Island, like the Tongariro National Park, uh, Hawke's Bay, and things like that. Also, Waikato and Wellington are quite common. They tend to prefer habitats such as pastures, tussock, and wetlands. And they're actually considered one of the few species that may have actually benefited from uh, humans coming around and opening up the forests, which is interesting. But typically they're like fertile riversides, farm dams, and natural pools. But the South Island, they can be found in more tussock river valleys and things like that. They prefer water bodies. They prefer grasslands on the edge of waters, so like the reed beds and forests as well. So they like those kind of habitats. So in terms of their breeding and ecology, they actually have a threat pose where they dip their head down and with their bill holders onto the ground. And if the female notices a threat on the water, she'll stretch out her neck and swim towards it and make a high-pitched call to kind of scare the predators away. So in terms of breeding as well, paradise shell ducks first breed within their second or third year where they form quite long-lasting bonds that can last for life and then defend their territories. And they'll often actually keep the same territory if one of their mates dies, they'll keep the same territory and then kind of wait for just another one to kind of come in and replace her so that they will find another mate. They have quite a long breeding season. It lasts from August to December with uh, these displays not being elaborate. They typically just like... Uh, so we just try and find a female thing like that. Uh, Paradise shell ducks can nest in a variety of places, including hollow logs or fallen trees, to rabbit burrows, under haystacks, places like that. They just find anywhere cool that's nice to hide in. Clutches are typically from 5 to 15 eggs, with an average of between 8 to 10. And most clutches will number over 12, being considered nest of two females. And their success rate is about 83% hatched, and their survival rate is 89%, so they do quite well. So the incubation period uh, for these babies lasts about 30 to 35 days. Uh, I've done the female after the nest uh, 21 to 22 hours a day, only leaving at dawn to dusk of one hour each, and they typically will stay around. The fledging period of downy lasts about eight weeks, and during that time they'll be fed and uh, feeding independently and be close to the mother. And typically their first time, they live on average two and a half years in the wild, but some individuals can live longer, with some even being found living to 23 years. And this molting season actually lasts from December to February. And the molting season is actually quite important because that allows them to be food for moldy. Uh, so that's when they are able to catch them and uh, they will hunt molting birds when the birds cannot fly. And this uh, selective hunting actually helps conserve the populations. And they actually did not hunt them during breeding seasons to help conserve the populations as well, which is interesting. And then they'll try to do that as well. And in terms of their foods and feeding, uh, what they eat, these guys are... Uh, diurnal uh, omnivores so they eat during the day let's see if we can find a male to talk about so they'll feed during the day and they'll feed panini on pasta grasses but they'll also eat a variety of uh, aquatic insects as well especially as babies uh they'll eat a variety of crops and crustaceans and earthworms and insects things like that and it just depends which is pretty interesting and in terms of conservation they are one of the most common native ducks you can actually hunt them during uh duck season uh, but they're actually they have no predators, but now with uh, stoats and weasels some populations have been threatened because they can kill them And uh, they've been parasites as well in terms of hunting. Uh, they are doing mostly. Okay I believe they are considered least concerned so they are doing okay unlike a lot of native New Zealand birds sadly, but um, You can hunt them during the uh, first Saturday of May to end of the 31st of July So this is a hunting season for ducks uh, you can hunt them along with introduced species like mallards and things like that. But there's obviously catch limits as well. And in terms of conservation, uh, their populations seem to be much smaller due to pre-settlement times due to increased forest cover. But after the settlers and land, their populations actually rise. Uh, but before it could rise, it was just drastically fluctuated because of overhunting and exploitation. But luckily they are now protected. And obviously, as I mentioned as well, you can hunt them during those seasons, but they are protected. 
and the estimated population is between 600,000 to 700,000. So that's doing quite okay, unlike, uh, sadly, a lot of New Zealand birds, but still a really, really cool animal. Definitely a big fan. So we're going to move off. So there's another great cake mod done. So this is Paradise Shell Duck. Uh, and as I mentioned, native to New Zealand. So one I've seen a lot. So a really, really cool one. It's nice to see some New Zealand animals, as we'll get into. So next up... Um, we have got the another one. We're moving over to China. We have got the Mandarin duck, and this is another one done by Great Cakes Mod, who's really done an awesome job. I have to find a male because the male is just stunning. So let's see. Yep, there we are. So here's the male. Really, really beautiful. So um, am I actually able? No, I can't do. I was going to say you should be able to switch to animals in the enclosure. Anyway. The Mandarin duck is a type of perching duck and native to the eastern Paleo-Arctic. Uh, it is sexually dimorphic, as you can see here. The males are quite a big, beautiful color there, and the females are much more drab. Uh, the females are uh, medium size, is about 41 to 49 centimeters, or 16 to 19 inches long, with uh, 65 to 75 or 26 to 30 inch wingspan. They are a close relative of the North American wood duck, and they live in the same genus. And the name Annex means uh, diving, so they're diving bird. And they have like a bonnet, which is like that really interesting colours they've got going on there. And outside of their made of range though, they have been introduced into Western Europe and the British Isles, with some pop more populations also living in North America. So in terms of description, they're one of the most distinctive uh, diminutive types of waterfowl, and they tend to have a smaller body size and shoulder height than a lot of dabbing ducks. But they're slightly smaller than American wood ducks, so they're kind of the smaller ducks. But you can see the male has that big red bill with uh, all the beautiful iridescent colors on the flanks as well. The vertical white bars. You can see all the orange around the neck there and the green on there. That's all like iridescent. Really, really beautiful orange feathers as well. But the females are quite a bit uh, similar as well. Let's look at the female. Where is the female? Where's the female? Females are quite similar in terms of their patterns, but not quite as extreme. You can see much more drab, but they still have the same kind of basic crests. And both male and female's crest, but the purple crest is more pronounced than the male. Females are a lot more drab colours. And like most other species, the males will undergo a molt during the mating season into that plumage. But when the ellipse plumage, the males will look similar to the female, but can be distinguished by the beak. And then this is kind of them and their breeding plumage. So that's when they're all nice and ready to breed. And mandarin ducks are almost identical in appearance to wood ducks and are very similar to mallard ducklings. And the main way we can tell them apart is the eye stripes. And there's been some mutations actually found in captivity where they look quite different from each other, um, like light ones. But you can see this one is here. This is a female. This is the male. You can see the differences in the sexes. Even the babies have different colors, which is really interesting. Well, let's look at this little baby here. So as I mentioned, they uh, live around East Asia, but large exports have reduced the population in Eastern Russia to China to between uh, below a thousand pairs of each country. However, they're still believed to be about 5,000 pairs in Japan. And the, the migratory, so they overwinter in low eastern China, Japan. And they have been collected, as I mentioned. There's a large feral population that's been found in Great Britain. And there's another in North Carolina and some other populations everywhere. So they are considered uh, at least concerned, but there is introduced populations. So a little bit invasive, just because people find them so pretty, they want to have them. But yeah, really, really cool. The habitat they tend to prefer is kind of dense, shrubby forest areas. And they mostly occur in low-lying areas, but may breed in high altitudes of up to 1,500 meters. And in winter, they'll occasionally occur in marshes and open rivers. Where they prefer fresh water, they've also been seen in lagoons and things like that. And in the introduced European range, they have been found in the edges of lakes and cultivated areas where near woods. That's where you can find them. So compared to other ducks, they're actually quite shy, and they prefer to hang out in the cover of trees and willows and form smaller flocks. But they may be bolder and can be as a result of becoming uh, used to humans. So if they're used to humans, they will become more bold. Typically in the wild, they tend to breed in densely watered areas near shallow lakes or marshes or ponds. And they nest in cavities and trees close to the winter and spring. And then a single clutch of uh, 9 to 12 eggs is laid, laid in April to May. And the male may defend the brooding female and his eggs. He himself do not sit on the eggs, so it's only the female. And then shortly after ducklings hatch, the mother actually flies to the ground to coax them. And then all the ducklings will jump out of the tree and then fall out, follow their mum to a nearby body of water. So in terms of their food and feeding, uh, they're very similar to... We'll have a look at the uh, female. We already had a look at the babies, but we'll have a look at the female. In terms of their feeding, they like to dab uh, or walking on land. 
So they use these to eat plants or seeds, especially by beach masks, but they'll also feed on sh uh, snails, insects, and small fish. The diet of these will actually change seasonally. So in the fall and winter, they'll eat acorns and grains. But in the spring, they'll eat more insects and snails and aquatic plants. Some other they'll eat worms, small fish, and small snakes and mollusks and things like that. And they'll feed mainly during dawn or dusk, and then they'll perch in trees uh, during the day or on the ground. So it's quite interesting as well. Let's look at a little baby here. So this is a baby male, I believe. Oh no, baby female. We'll have a look at you. Very, very cute. So in terms of threats, they are various part of their range. There are lots of predators that can eat them. That includes mink, raccoon dogs, otters, polecats, owls, and grass snakes. And the greatest threat to them conservation-wise is logging. And hunting is also a threat because they're often unable to recognize them in flight and shoot them by accident. But they're not really hunting and fleed uh, for food. But they are extremely prized because they're extremely beautiful, and that's why they're considered a prized hunting one, so they can get poached occasionally. Well, let's look at you. And in terms of Chinese, Chinese culture, the Mandarin duck, uh, the, the Pinyang, I believe, is a standard for male and female, and they're believed to be like like long uh, couples, unlike other species of duck, which is interesting. And the Chinese proverbs is a metaphor, so two mandarin ducks play in the water, and it's kind of a symbol used for Chinese weddings, as you know, unlikely pairs and things like that. And there's other, some cultural references, but yeah, really, really cool little animal here. Definitely a big fan of these guys, especially these guys. Cute little mandarin ducks. So, Great Cakes mod is also, uh, Great Cakes mod also did a wonderful job. Love these cute little guys, definitely a big fan. So next up, last but certainly not least, this we've got by Narwhaler. We've got another species of goose. We've got here the bar-headed goose. So these uh, bar-headed goose are a goose that breeds in Central Asia in colonies of thousands in South Asia, and it can be found as far south as India in the peninsula. Uh, so in terms of taxonomy, they're uh, Acer, and they're no, no other members of the region. They're monotypic genus. Uh, they were originally was based on a monotypic genus, but that genus is now considered uh, Acer. So in terms of their uh, body, they don't look too different from other goose. They're equally distinguishable from any other grey geese because of their black uh, bands on their head. And they're also much paler than a lot of the geese species. And in flight, they honk like a typical goose. They're a medium-sized in terms of goose. Uh, they typically get about 71 to 76 centimeters, or about 28 to 30 inches in total length, and weigh between 1.8 to 3.2 kilograms, or about 4 to 7 pounds. Uh, in terms of their ecology, they tend to live in supper habitats at a high altitude lakes. Uh, the species has been found migrating south from Tibet, Kazakhstan, uh, Mongolia, and Russia before crossing the Himalayas. And it comes to the detection as they may have been an early victim of the H5N1 virus, or the bird flu. And they also suffer predation from crows, foxes, ravens, sea eagles, gulls, and others. And while the population may actually be increasing, and uh, but it's complex to assess those trends, and they're quite common over a huge area. And they're also considered one of the world's, world's highest flying birds, as they've been recorded flying across Mount Malaku, which is the fifth highest mountain in the world at about 8,481 or 27,000 feet. And apparently over Mount Everest as well, which is 29,000 feet. And although this is second-hand reported with no verification, uh, this demanding nature seems that these guys are great, uh, quite good at breathing at quite high altitude. So that's why they have that bird system, uh, multiple air sac system that most birds have, pretty much all birds have, to breathe. And they must be quite well adapted to flying at quite high altitudes, which is very interesting. And the challenging uh, migration northwards is the lowland India. They breed to some of Tibetan plateau, and they fly across the Himalayas, then to come down to like Southeast Asia as well. And there have been some studies looking at the altitude of around 6,000 to 21,000 feet is like on average. And they tend to, tend to prefer going lower, but they can go fly high if they need to. And even one that was recorded reaching 23,000 feet as needed. And they've been observed flying over 7,000 meters or 23,000 feet in the air. So typically we'll migrate over the Himalayas during and spend the winter parts in South Asia. So part all the way down from Hassim to Talanundu, so like, it's like pretty much Sri Lanka. And the modern uh, winter habitat is species cultivated fields where they actually damage crops. And birds from Kazakhstan actually be seen to stop over in Tibet for about 20 to 30 days before keep going. And they have high site fidelity, so they will return to different sites if they know they've been good. Uh, in terms of their nesting, they test mainly nest on the Tibetan plateau. And they've actually been known to enter Pacific brood paratism. So some will actually kind of put their eggs uh, in the nests of higher ranking females within the flock. 
So lower ranking females will go and lay one and basically like make them raise their babies, which is quite interesting. They're also quite often kept in captivity and is considered beautiful and breeds readily and have been sightings seen in Great Britain and they seem to establish in Great Britain because of us and also are believed to have been released or escaped in Florida, but there's no evidence of a population. It's interesting as well. And there has been a lot of adaptations looking at them to see how they deal with being such high uh, altitude livers, uh, living in high altitudes. The hemoglobin actually have a higher affinity oxygen than low altitude geese as well, so they're quite well adapted, like high hemoglobin, which means they can have more oxygen in their blood. Also, there have been more capillaries uh, that allow more blood to get into their muscles to compensate as well, so they're quite well adapted. Um, and also the mitochondria in the cells, which is the main site of oxygen consumption, is actually significantly closer, which increases the distance. So they have a lot of adaptions within their body to allow them to deal with lower oxygen habitats, which is really interesting. And they also have a slightly larger wing area for their weight than other geese species, because air is thinner and up higher, so that having that little bit of a larger wing allows them to be able to uh, fly better, which is quite interesting, especially in those higher altitudes. And uh, one thing as well, um, you know, and then there's increased power output actually requires a flight in air because they need to flap harder than the lowland, uh, flap harder than the lowland birds. A little bit of a cute little baby while we talk about uh, the cultural depictions. So they've actually been suggested to be the model for Hassam, uh, Has Hamsa in Indian mythology, and they've been often interpreted as like a swan, things like that. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Definitely like these guys, especially like cool talking about the adaptations that they are adapted for living around the Tibetan plateau and being able to fly so high. So uh, it shows that these guys are living in extremes, are quite well adapted for the habitats they live in, especially around the Himalayas. So yeah, there's another great mod done by Nora Waller. So um, yeah, I'm going to zoom out and I think this is a great place to end the video. So, you know, Scott also did a wonderful job. Great cakes mod as well. Leaf and uh, Nora Waller and Nick. Uh, Nicholas Lion Rider, all done a wonderful job with these mods. Love seeing more birds, and they're only just starting. I've got like a lot more parts to do with this, so we've got a lot more mods coming. So um, better stay tuned. And if you guys like this video, always remember to like and subscribe. The, uh, it, remember to click on the bell icon to get notified about anything, especially since it's going to be a lot of Planet Zoo mod videos coming. And I hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye